Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1972 Italian giallo film The Red Queen Kills Seven Times, and it's available on the Shutter streaming service when I'm doing this review at the moment. Now, I will say this isn't my favorite giallo film, and it actually ranks towards the bottom of a list I'm keeping of all the giallo I've seen, but to be fair, a lot of what I've seen is either good to great giallo, and if you think about it, that's probably mainly all that survived, you know, like four, you know, five, four, five, six decades, like, well, not six, three, four, or five decades later, depending on when it was done. So the good stuff, the good to great stuff, for the most part, is what stuck around. There's not a whole lot of bad stuff that we can get our hands on in the U.S., so this is solid, not my favorite, but I will say this, it is definitely better than the this director's other uh, giallo film. He only did two, um, Emilio Miraglia. The other one he did was The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave, which I also have a review for on my channel. That one is definitely my least favorite. Now, this one ranks just above it, but it is significantly better in my opinion, so just saying. So like I said, directed by Emilio Miraglia who was also involved in the writing of the script for this film. Uh, also involved with it is Fabio Pitoru, who wrote scripts for The Weekend Murders, The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave, Shadows Unseen, Nine Guests for a Crime, and Macho Killers. <laughs> Great titles. Love it. Uh, and Marina M Malfatti is in this film. She looked familiar to me, so I looked her up. I was like, who is that playing Francisca? Uh, and because I was like, she looks so familiar. I think she was also in The Night at Evelyn Came Out of the Grave. And I was correct. She played Gladys in that film. Uh, she's also been in Seven Bloodstained Orchids, which I plan on seeing at some point because it is Giallo. And also All the Colors of the Dark, which I have also seen. And there is a review for it on my channel, so you can check that one out. That also has my favorite uh, Giallo actress, Edwige Fenech, in it. So it's a good one. This film was shot mainly in Germany, but it actually never opened theatrically in Germany. That is a weird thing to happen, totally weird thing to happen, but it, it happened. It opened in the U.S. as the film Blood Feast in 1975. I know there was another film called Blood Feast, so I'm sure there's some confusion with that, but um, that's probably why when we're seeing it now, it is called The Red Queen Kills Seven Times, which, by the way, I think is a really cool title, especially how it ties into the storyline of the film and the story that you're told by the grandfather pretty much immediately in the film. I like that a lot. The apartment where Hoffman lives in, uh, in this film is actually the exact same place that the wards live in the film uh, the uh, the Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, sorry, which I also have a review for on this channel, and it is a Giallo film, and it is quite good. Which, by the way, I should now say that I have an entire playlist on my channel for Giallo film reviews, which I have like 20-some maybe at this point. I'm going to keep going, too. I'm doing this. All right, so let's talk about the events of this film. Eveline's stabbing fit and saying that she was compelled by the painting is a small bit of the history of the castle coming through in the new red and black queens, and that is what you are meant to believe with the setup with the film. You know, the grandfather tells the story to Kitty and to Eveline, and at that point, we believe that they are sisters, but we find out at the end that they're not, that in fact, Eveline was, that, what was her name, was sent away. One of the women, Rosemary, was sent away, and that was actually Kitty's sister, and they brought Eveline in. It was kind of like a swap of kids and said you know you you are siblings and it was meant to be done to kind of break this curse that happens every 100 years where you know everything there's a whole like long story he tells about the grandfather tells about i can't remember all of it at this point but the crux of it basically being that the uh black queen ends up killing the red queen accidentally or on purpose and then the red queen rises from the grave and exacts her revenge and ends up killing seven people total and that seventh person ending up being the black queen and that has always happened every 100 years so eveline and rosemary were switched for the purpose of trying to break that but you can't break curses like that and in fact in this case it was used to the advantage of Franziska to try and get full inheritance because she was very pissed off that Eveline and Kitty were outliving their lives and she was stuck 
taking care of the grandfather as we find out in the end which is a believable uh motive that that's for sure uh also why would the grandpa tell the story uh to the kids especially if he believes it's bs that's one of the things that never really made sense to me when i watched the film is that why would he be telling these kids? Because he then dismisses it as BS. I mean, obviously you find out later that he really does believe in it. Otherwise, why would he have switched Rosemary and Evelyn? But why would he be telling the kids this? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially at their age. I don't know. But but early on, you do believe that, there, that that could be an actual thing that's going to happen in the film, this whole curse happening again, because of how violent Evelyn becomes in the very beginning, like stabbing that doll, which is disturbing, and then saying that the painting made her do it. So like that kind of plants the seed in the audience's mind that there might be a supernatural element to it. But when you find out in the very end, there's absolutely none of that. There may never have even been a curse that all of this was used as a ruse for Francisca to take people out and get the full inheritance from the grandfather, which, you know, that's a pretty sweet castle, I'll say. Uh, I, I put in here while I was watching, uh-oh, it's happening. Kitty accidentally killed Evelyn, and it's 100 years after the last time. I like how they do set that up and how Kitty was saying, oh, I accidentally killed Evelyn. Although I wish they kind of would have explained why they were fighting in the first place because they never do. That's just they're randomly fighting, which I think was kind of set up with how it was said early on and shown that they just fight all the time. But I mean, they were much older. It didn't really make that much sense. I really think they should have said why they were fighting and come up with a good reason. So she accidentally kills her. And then you find out in the end that she was actually still alive. She was just bleeding when her body was floating in the water. And Francisco went to let her up and then actually decided, mm, I'm just going to kill her right now because I don't want her to be in line for this inheritance at this point. But then she also saw it as a great opportunity to be like, oh yeah, Kitty, uh, you did kill her, but I'll keep your secret. I'm your ally when all along, definitely not her ally. And neither is Herbert who also got roped into it, Francisca's husband. Just like the night Evelyn came out of the grave, there's a cool castle and an inheritance people are fighting over. Two common themes between these two films. So, I guess uh, Miraglia doesn't stray far from his source material, from that one source material for these two movies. Lulu immediately seems suspicious to me because of the scene of her hitting on Martin and then it goes to the scene of Hans being killed, who was her husband at that point. Now, you do find out that Lulu was involved to a degree, um, but there were a lot of people involved with this. The inspector introduces the idea that the description of the killer can't be seen as being reliable. I do like that, and that ends up being a very key clue in the actual film because people keep saying they see Evelyn, they see Evelyn, they see Evelyn, and we find out in the end that Evelyn is actually Rosemary who's wearing a prosthetic mask and is masquerading as the Red Queen uh, as Evelyn. And, he, and she's convincing because a lot of people say when they get a quick glimpse of her that it is Evelyn, even... Um, What's that terrible dude's name? He, he's barely in it. The guy who was dealing drugs at the same time. I have his name in here somewhere. But that guy ended up saying that he, he believed it was her. And he was obsessed with her. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, when Kitty got the voice message from Eveline, I thought it, it uh, has to be someone who knows that she's dead. Francisca said she knows. And why would there even be a third sister? So I did kind of guess that Francisca may be involved or was the main person involved very early on because when that message is left and it's uh, uh, masqueraded as Evelyn's voice, you think, well, who? it has to be someone who actually knows about this. And based on the way it was set up, nobody knows that Evelyn's really dead except for Kitty, Francisca, and Herbert. And that's it. So it had to be Francisca, especially because when you think about it, Evelyn... In the very beginning, Evelyn and Kitty are the only ones who actually matter. So why is there a third sister introduced? The process of elimination says because she's involved. So I did guess it very early on, although it did take, take a lot of twists and turns. They kind of threw me from moment to moment. And I didn't see it coming that so many people would actually be involved. So that was good. I did enjoy that. Um... In these films, if someone wants to tell you something later, they won't be alive for long, like Lenore, 
who says she thinks she knows who the Red Queen is, and she tells that to Kitty, and then she's like, oh, but I'll tell you later. Well, of course she's not going to tell you later, because always in these films, if someone's going to tell you later, they're not going to, because they're going to be dead. Uh, that happened a lot in the um, Bella, uh, Black Belly of the Tarantula, which is a fun one to watch, and is better than this film, I will say. I like how the inspector asks Martin about his whereabouts during Lenore's murder, and he says at a meeting with 18 people, the inspector, uh, oh, uh, Martin says that he was in a meeting with 18 people. He just, like, could, could have been making that up. So the inspector responds by saying, that's enough people, and then he moves on. Then he stops questioning him. It's so, it's not believable, and it's one of those weird moments where it's like he definitely would be pressing him a lot harder instead of saying, hey, where were you during this person's murder? And he's just like, yeah, I was at a meeting with 18 people. And he's just like, okay, well, that's enough people. I don't even need to talk to these people. I don't even need their names. I don't need to get an actual alibi. As long as you tell me it's more than one person, okay. Uh, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And there are a few of those things in the script that are just like, for convenience sake, now we'll just move on. Uh, that's one of those moments for sure. Probably the worst one. The inspector then nonchalantly drops information that Martin's wife is in a psychiatric hospital, which he doesn't really press either. Terrible inspector. Uh, it seems like a good candidate for the Red Queen, especially with the laughing during and after killing. And then she even talks about Evelyn when Martin ends up visiting her too. So she is a good red herring for that reason, but I still don't understand why the inspector does not pursue this like at all. He's just like, oh, by the way, how's your wife who's in the psychiatric hospital? Is she still there? Oh, she's good. Okay. It's just... It makes no sense. Like, worst inspector ever, if I do say so myself. Uh, Elizabeth's death, the the wife who is in the psych psychiatric hospital, is pretty nasty, um, where she's going to climb up the, um, the gate and it gets pulled out from under her, which I believe is Rosemary who does that because she's dressed up as the Red Queen, and she falls down and, like, impales, like, right through here with the spike of the gate, the way they showed it, like with her head on it and how much blood was gushing out, it looked pretty brutal. It looked pretty good. That was my favorite death scene in the film by far. Uh, it was the most violent and gory too, so it was good. The shot of the Red Queen running down the hallway with her cape flowing, holding up a knife is really cool. That was the one that was part of uh, one of Kitty's nightmares. Uh, they shot it kind of like a long shot of her you know, starting very small in the background and just, like, running towards the camera and just, like, the flowing cape, her holding up the knife. It looks cool. It looked really, really, really good. So there are a few of those kind of flourishes with the camera that uh, seem very inspired and, and cool. Was there a purpose for the scene where Peter rapes Kitty? That's the guy's name, Peter, uh, the drug dealer guy. I would say no. There was absolutely no reason for the rape scene. Uh, I assume that they put it in there so that you could end up seeing Kitty naked. Uh, that was an excuse for that, but that's not a good excuse for that because it doesn't add to the story at all. We already know that Peter's a piece of garbage. He's dealing drugs for Christ's sake. He also shows up immediately in the film as soon as he shows up, and he threatens Kitty because he wants to know where Evelyn is, and then we find out that he wants in on Evelyn's money too, so... You know, it, it, totally pointless. Like, rape scenes, I'm I'm fine with them in film if they have an actual purpose. This one has absolutely no purpose in the film. It's inexcusable, in my opinion. I wonder how they shot Peter's death scene. Because it looks very dangerous, stunt-wise. Uh, the one where he's being dragged by the car and then it, like, runs him into, like, the curb... Uh, that looked really dangerous to shoot, and I would be very interested to know how they did that, and hopefully no one was actually injured during that, because it looked dangerous. Uh, but it looked convincing for the film. A few, uh, a few quick times, um, you do see the face of the Red Queen. She does look like Evelyn, and Peter thinks it's her, and he was obsessed with her, so that kind of really plants in the audience's mind is this Evelyn actually come back to life? But then, you know, we find out that Rosemary, well, even before we know it's Rosemary, we find uh, the place where Lulu was shot and killed eventually, and there was all the stuff there for making that uh, mask of Evelyn, and there were pictures of Evelyn and everything, so you're like, oh, okay. So she didn't come back from the grave, especially because a few times her body is checked on. That's 
randomly in a vault in the dungeon that apparently doesn't stink because when people open it up they're not like oh my god which is pretty unrealistic because that body would stink horribly at that point because it's been like months right at that point i think so uh martin thinking uh thinks lulu uh to killing via linking i'm sorry my writing i messed up uh, Martin linking Lulu to the killings via the necklace is a moment you knew was actually coming since he made such a big point of noticing the necklace when she showed up and seduced him. Uh, also, the fact that she did seduce him after they talked about having an alibi for Lenore's death was unbelievably suspicious. So, yeah. So that link was was interesting. But you knew it was coming. Note that whispering is something that a lot of killers use in Giallo films. You wouldn't think so, but it actually really does disguise a voice. Obviously, it's used in this. It's used in a ton of Giallo films, and it actually is effective because because it's so low and because it uh, you know kind of morphs the ma the the voice enough. It's very hard to tell. Even times it's been used this way in some Giallo, it's hard to tell if the voice is male or female. So it works. It works very well. Was it ever revealed earlier that Rosemary was a Wilden Brook? No. Uh, it gets said, it's kind of weird because it gets said that she is before it's revealed that she is. Um, but it, but the way that it's brought up is kind of like a, you should have already known that, like you were already introduced to that information, and you definitely weren't. So it's kind of this weird thing. So they kind of spoil the information before they get to that kind of big reveal of Rosemary being involved. So I didn't like that. I think they should change that. There's a real excessive use of rats in the basement of this film, uh, in the castle. Uh, I know that it's a way to symbolize, you know, scary and and dark. But also maybe it was a way to symbolize how um, conniving and terrible the family was. It's just a bunch of rats, I guess. But it's just way too many rats. And I, you know, I understand that way back it was this tying in of like you know gross and dirty and disgusting you know associated with rats i understand that but you don't need to use this many and i especially think it's funny at the part where the water's coming in um because they're, they're trying to drown kitty in that little vault area where evelyn's body is and uh there you can tell that someone is physically shoving the rats out of out of the uh the pipe where the water's coming out because a lot of them are trying to go the opposite direction and they get pushed. It's uh, it's just too much though. I do like the reveal of Francisca having actually killed Eveline and then bringing Rosemary back into the family, getting her hooked on drugs and making her go out and kill. Um, yeah, so it wasn't just that she that she told Rosemary, hey, you're actually part of this family, but then she intentionally gets her hooked on drugs so she can kind of have her not totally cognizant so she wouldn't be as opposed to killing people and then she sends her out killing people so um yeah i like that extra touch it takes it a little further to you know maybe it's not so believable but it is interesting for the film and i think that the drug aspect of things for rosemary is probably what's supposed to explain that kind of maniacal laughing that ends up happening at the at the scenes of the crimes just saying the grandpa said that the events that happened every 100 years are always the same. So he switched Rosemary and Evelyn to break the curse. How did he not realize it could then involve Francisca? That's what doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I understand that it's probably a situation where maybe they were closest in age or maybe part of the curse was that it was the first two born or something like that. But the fact that it, it, the story as it's told in the film is is not that specific so it just seems like it's a, a sister and another sister as the red and black queens within the curse so when he's just like well i'll get rid of rosemary and bring this eveline in but there's francisca so i don't know so so really i mean the the curse kind of does uh, manifest in a way, but mainly just because the idea of it was planted in the minds of people and Francisca found out about it and used it, but yeah, I don't know. It's just the grandpa's 
reasoning for doing what he did didn't make sense especially when he verbalizes in the beginning that he thinks it's bs you could say that he says that just to make sure that other people don't believe it to kind of deny it and not put too much stock in it but then at the same time why is he telling people about it you know it's just doesn't make any sense uh pretty solid film but it does drag it drags too much i mean it's not it's not unwatchable or anything. Like I said, it's definitely better than the night Evelyn came out of the grave, but um, it's not great. It's it's towards the bottom of my list. Uh, it's worth watching once. I think it's solid enough, and I wouldn't give it a terrible rating. So that said, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a three-star rating. It is good enough. I think the core story plays out pretty well, but there's just a lot of extra crap that's not needed the runtime is too long it should be edited down things need to go a little bit quicker with the film yeah but yeah i mean a decent decent uh, concept i kind of wish that i would have watched this one before the night evelyn came out of the uh, grave because i think it's um it, it would have made me a little less tired of the whole castle and inheritance thing because i just saw that with the other film now, um, it's interesting to note that Miraglia did uh, The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave first, and then he did The Red Queen Kill 7. So he uh, did a not good job at first, and then he honed his skills a little bit better for the next one. So good. Um, he didn't do any other Giallo. That was it. Just these two. So I'm fine with that, because on my main list, these two are at the bottom. But anyway... Would love to hear what other people have to say about this film or Giallo in general. What are some of your favorite Giallo films? Um, especially if I haven't seen them because I'd like to get those on my list to check out. I still have a bunch that I'm working on. Put some comments down there we can talk. Uh, do me a quick favor though. Hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I have ever done. That is your best way to repay me. I don't make money doing this or anything. I'm just spending my time trying to build a community of horror nerds so we can talk and be nerdy. And my the fact that I'm doing watch parties now through Scener with Shudder uh, is kind of the next step of that too. So I can talk kind of face, uh, what am I trying to say? Cyber face to face with people I can talk about films as we watch them. So yeah. So I'm doing that. But anyway, hit that subscribe button uh, to repay me. And uh, also hit the notification bell because that way you'll know when I'm putting up any sort of new video. But regardless, I do appreciate you taking your time to uh, watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.